Hello everyone. I've made quite a few videos on how to compose symphonies. Those videos involve writing an actual symphony step by step, which is a long and involved process. Today, I wanted to give you a shorter lesson that I think you'll enjoy. I'm going to take a very simple tune and show you some of the things you can do to it with an orchestra. It's an easy lesson, something you can easily do on your own and learn a lot while doing it. I recommend it if you're just starting out or if you're already an expert and just want to reaffirm the basics. Or if you're not here to compose your own music, then I think you'll still enjoy seeing how a big orchestra is put together. I wrote a really simple tune for the violins. I don't want anything complicated here to put anyone off, so I wrote down notes as fast as they popped into my head, and the result is quite silly. You can write any tune you want, complex or simple, brilliant or kind of dumb like this one, or borrow a favorite tune. Composers traditionally learned by taking other people's tunes and orchestrating them. Already I want to say something about the orchestration. When you write for strings, you should always be thinking about the phrasing and the bowing. Notice I've put in bowing marks. The violins play these three notes all on one bow, probably a down bow, to give emphasis to the start of the tune. Then the next three notes are played on a single up bow, and so on. But here and there, I've altered that pattern of bowing to give an expressive shape to the melody. Let me play the tune for you. It's very square. Four phrases, each phrase with four measures, overall 16 measures. You can't get more boring. Next, I wrote a bass line for it in the cellos. When you have a tune, part of orchestrating it is giving it a bass line, or a counter melody, or maybe many interlocking counter melodies, to give it more depth and complexity. Here, I stuck to the bare minimum just to make the point. Let's listen. Before we get to the rest of the orchestra, I want to make a very important point about the strings. The string orchestra, just by itself, has so many possible sounds and tone colors that you can do a lot of orchestrating just with it alone. A lot of people treat the strings as a general background, like the white sandwich bread with the other instruments as the spicy fixings on the sandwich. And a lot of times that's how it functions. But it's a good idea to get into the habit of treating the string orchestra as full of varied sounds and colors and possibilities. Here are a few combinations I've put together to illustrate the point. In the first four measures, the first phrase of the tune, I filled out the full string orchestra. The first violins and second violins double each other an octave apart. This is a distinct, very useful, very common tool in the orchestration toolkit, and I wanted you to hear what that sounds like. It gives a very big, rich, uplifting sound. Underneath, I've taken the cello bass line and doubled it in the string basses, which sound an octave lower than written. This is another very common sound. Almost all bass lines in string orchestras are written this way, with the cellos supported an octave lower by the rich resonance of the string basses. In between, I've used the violas to fill in the gap, adding to the harmonic body the sense of fullness. So this is a very standard big string orchestra. But we don't have to go big. There are other sounds available. For the next four measures, I've used a different orchestration. Here's our tune, our cello bass line, and I've stuck in some cute little violin flourishes popping up on top, just so you can hear flashes of color and sonic variation all contained within the string orchestra. For the next four measures, I've done something different again. I've used the second violins and violas together, almost like percussion instruments, whacking on these dense chords. That will give a different sound altogether. 
And finally, for the last four measures of the tune, I've put in some runs. Zip! Again, I just want you to see the kinds of embellishments and colors that the string orchestra offers. Of course, this barely scratches the surface. There are many other wonderful sounds you can get out of a string orchestra, some of them common, some more rare, but I want to give a few examples and make the point that you can create a lot of different sounds. Let's listen. I know it comes off a bit chaotic because so many different sound options are stuck in side by side, but that's okay. We're not creating art here. We're just illustrating some basic orchestration methods. Next, let's talk about the woodwinds. One of the most common uses of woodwinds in the orchestra is for doubling a melody in the strings. They add color to the melody and different woodwind instruments add different color. Sometimes you have a melody carried all the way through by violins and flute. Sometimes you change the tone color in the middle of the melody, switching from one woodwind instrument to another. Here I wanted to give you the sound of each woodwind color. First, the flute, which is often an octave higher than the string melody. Otherwise the flute will disappear on you. The oboes here again an octave higher than the violins, although that's not always the case. Then we have the clarinet, which has a more robust sound, and is more often in unison with the string melody. And finally, the bassoon. Here I've put them in the upper register, a beautiful, silky, woody register of the instrument. These are just four examples. Really, the palette of tone colors is amazing. Flutes in the upper range have a cutting, brilliant sound like diamonds. Flutes in the lowest register sound smoky and throaty, rustic almost. Oboes in the very high register sound thin and terrible, but in the lowest register they sound amazing, like a, a goose honking, and sometimes you want a sound effect just like that. The clarinets also have a distinct lower register sound, so vibrant and powerful that it is much loved by many composers. And the bassoon also has a middle register where it does most of its work, and a powerful grunting lower register. And on top of that, you can have many other woodwind instruments. These are the four standard ones in any orchestra, but you can add a piccolo, and an English horn, and a bass clarinet, and a contrabassoon. But here I want to illustrate at least the four standard sounds. Let's listen. Notice that I overlapped the instruments to smooth the transitions, otherwise it gets kind of hard on the ears. I hope that you were able to hear these four distinct sounds that entirely change the character of the melody. Alright, let's move on. Woodwinds are often combined to create a greater range of effects, but be warned, as you combine them, they start to lose their distinct tone colors, and they can turn into a generalized woodwind sound which is a little boring if it's overused. A very common combination is oboes doubled by flutes and octave higher. It produces a sparkling, cheerful sound. Here's another combo you sometimes see, oboes and clarinets in unison. I'm not a fan of this one. Even though I personally avoid this combo, I've put it in here to give you a sense of the sound. Here's my favorite combo, clarinets doubled by flutes and octave higher. Beautiful, lyrical sound. When it's quiet, it sounds like silk. When it's loud, it stands out without sounding hard or cutting. And finally, here's all the woodwinds. Sometimes you want this generalized woodwind sound if you're in a loud part and the woodwinds need to compete with other sections of the orchestra. There are, of course, lots of other combinations, but these are some of the common ones. Listen carefully to each sound and how it's different from the others.
All right, time to move on. Woodwinds are not just used to double string melodies. They have a lot of different uses, and I've illustrated a few of them here. In the first measures, they play chords to give a resonance and tint of color to the background. I think I described them once as multicolored tapestries on the walls in the background. Here, the woodwinds have the melody, in this case, my favorite combo of clarinet and flute, but they're not doubling the violins. Instead, the violins are taking up the background chords. So it's a roll reversal from the first four measures and a good reminder that the woodwinds can have their own independence and carry the main tune. Orchestration doesn't have to be always so string dominated, although that's probably easier to do at the outset. Next, you have the woodwinds doing a kind of oom um, pa pa background, rhythmically independent of the strings, just adding some complexity, some layering to the music. Sometimes this kind of thing is called woodwind chatter. And finally, I've put in an example of woodwinds acting as sustaining instruments, these long sustaining notes. Horns often play this role as well, and so I've put them in here, forming a temporary alliance with the woodwinds. The sustaining notes are a lot like the pedal on a piano. Here you've got one note, everyone's playing a G, for two measures. Remember the clarinets and horns are transposing instruments, that's why it doesn't look like a G. That sustaining note lives in the background and blends the sound, smooths it, smears it a little, gives some resonance and fullness to the orchestra. Any instrument can fill this role of the sustaining note. And I mean every instrument that you see here, even the timpani. Imagine a quiet timpani roll in the background, or the trombones playing a quiet dark octave in the background, or a whisper of a sustaining note low down in the string basses, and so on. It depends on what sound you want in the moment. But the most common instruments for this sustaining function, in my observations anyway, are the oboe, the clarinet, the horns more than anything else, and sometimes the viola. Anyway, let's listen to this sampling of woodwind methods. These are four examples of woodwinds acting independently of the strings rather than simply doubling the strings. Finally, let's talk about the brass section. I've already snuck in the horns in the last example, teaming up with the woodwinds, but let's consider the brass as a unit. I've given a few examples of brass writing here. First, the stereotypical heavy, bombastic brass chords. Horns and trumpets are doubling each other for added power. I usually like to use four horns. Some composers use up to eight. I think it would look crowded here, so I'm only using two which is more classical. Many composers use three or six trumpets, but again, I don't want to crowd the notes, and two trumpets is fairly classical. Trombones always come in threes, and here they're pounding away on these fist-like closed chords, along with the timpani. This will sound loud and grandiose. Next, I want to show you a very standard approach in classical and early Romantic orchestration that sometimes also carried through in later music. Before trombones were a big thing in orchestras, the power came from horns and trumpets in octaves, simply hitting the main notes with timpani again. This will sound noble and powerful. Here, I just want to remind you that brass instruments can carry melodies beautifully. They typically don't in a classical orchestra, but through the Romantic period, they became more popular for that use. And later, of course, they took on a bigger melodic role. Think about movie music like John Williams, where the melodies are often carried by horns and trumpets. Here, the strings are relegated to background chords, and I've got a horn melody, which can have a beautiful, warm sound. And I've put the trombones on the bass line to give it a bit of counterweight. And finally, what is this? The point I want to make here is that all these pieces of the orchestra can be integrated together. Woodwinds playing a melodic role, clarinets doubling the violins, woodwinds carrying the background chords, 
horns and trombones in a temporary alliance, supplying sustaining notes, trumpets and timpani blatting out a triumphant rhythm, violins carrying the melody, in this case first and second violins an octave apart for a bigger sound, and the lower strings carrying the bass line. For added emphasis, you've got a quadruple stop and a triple stop in the violins, a very punchy sound as the bow rakes over several strings. Let's listen to these examples of brass writing and of integrating the brass into the rest of the orchestra. Very stirring. But how about we go back to the beginning and listen through all these orchestral examples so you can really pay attention to the different sounds. I have to say this is not a musical masterpiece. I tried hard not to make it clever and artistic or any kind of concert show piece, which I think would have distracted from the lessons on orchestration. The point is to show you, in as straightforward a way as I can, how a very unremarkable tune can sound different by using different orchestral techniques. And I recommend trying this as an exercise. For this particular exercise, you don't want to sweat trying to compose beautiful or clever music. That can be very inhibiting. Instead, just slap a dumb tune down on staff lines and practice orchestrating it in a bunch of different ways. In any case, here's the full thing. <laughs> 